list so that you're on the list. So I'm on the list because I really wanted her. Okay, I'm going to get started. I think it's really important for you folks to know um, exactly what it is that we're talking about when we talk about energy with our animals and how it affects them. Um, and it's just to help you learn how to center, to work with your mind a little bit more so that when you are working with animals, you can be more in the present. It's just different tools to help you get there. So um, on that note, um, Teresa, can you, is, are you guys okay back there? Is that too bright for you? You're good? If I can ask you all to close your eyes, please, as you relax, and take a real deep breath from the bottom of your feet all the way up, inhale it through your nose, and let it go out your mouth. So we're going to take a deep breath, relaxed, all the way from your nose, inhale, and exhale out your mouth. Specifically, my, my background is mostly with dogs, so I'm going to focus on, on canines. Um, but the thing that you have to remember is every time you are in the presence of your dog, your dog is learning, and that starts from birth, okay? Every time you accept a behavior from a dog, you've just taught that dog that that's what you want. Whoever has this understands that the dog is going to be reacting to what's traveling down that leash. Now, what you're seeing here is a dog that is not very confident, doing a little bit of what we call displaced behavior. Now with Miranda, I'm not going to do anything to try and encourage her to interact with me. I'm going to let her choose her own time and her own way of doing it. You want to be the leader in your animal's life. And that means the leader in the animals that are living with you as rescues. The whole leadership mentality is based on a dog or an animal looking to a human and saying, that person's going to make way better decisions than I can make for myself. So I'm just going to hang out back here and wait to be told what to do. <laughs> and then you look at him. Let's go. Okay, it's time to go. <laughs> Upon your first glance, a dog that drops to the ground is definitely showing a high level of avoidance, which is commonly seen in high-level fearful dogs. You'll go to walk them, and they drop. And then you kind of drag them, <laughs> right? Dogs don't have a memory. They make associations. And they carry lots of baggage. So if you have a dog that's come from an abused past, a fearful past, a nervous past, and they come into the present, which is right now, in your hand, in this right now, the moment, everything has an opportunity to be left at the curb right now. The second you meet that dog, the first second you meet the dog, you're making a decision. Am I picking up his bags and carrying them with us? Or am I leaving them there? Thank you. Um, I, my paying job, <laughs> I'm a professor at UCF College of Medicine, and I teach doctors about nutrition. And uh, my unpaying job is I run the Arf Shack Dog Rescue. If you have a starving dog, okay, emaciated dog, the, the most, your most important thing is you have to refeed that dog before you're going to do any significant behavioral rehabilitation. It's the same thing with people. You can't reason with, you can't work with uh, somebody that's like really bad anorexia until you restore the nutritional health. But don't, don't, don't do too much. Again, little is better. Focus on a balance of refeeding the dog until you go too far because, you, again, brain chemistry and all these things have to be in place for the true work to take place so the nutrition can provide the foundation. When do I call my veterinarian? When do you need to call and ask for help with vomiting? And my rule of thumb, and I ask my technicians if they say, does so-and-so need to come in, I say, can they hold down water? If they cannot hold down water, they need to go to a veterinarian. When do you make your dog vomit? When do you not make your dog vomit? So when do you not make your dog vomit is when they swallow an acid or an alkali or a heavy duty cleaner. It burnt once going down, it's going to burn coming back up, exactly. Immediately 
time is of the essence, get them to water, a lukewarm bath. Get them completely soaked down and a fan on them, alcohol on the ear pads, alcohol on the feet. Hopefully everybody has clippers here if you're doing foster because you're going to need them. You're going to clipper the wounds, flush them out with an antibacterial solution, apply antibiotics, then go see your veterinarian. Um, what you need to do is you need to rest the GI tract. So whatever insulted um, the GI tract could be a bacteria, it could be they ate a food that didn't agree with them, it could be stress. Um, the majority of our animals, as she said, are rescues. Come here, buddy. And Poe will live in the house with regular dogs and cats. Yeah. Everybody thinks possums are so ugly, but everybody changes their mind when they meet Poe. Opossums typically in the wild live about three years. Ours typically live five years. I had one that lived seven years. You would have never known she was old. Now, a lot of people own pets in Central Florida. 60% of the population, believe it or not, has some kind of pet in their house. Who is the person who is most likely to take advantage of what I do? You know, I can talk to everybody, but is it everybody that I'm going to be able to motivate, or is there a prospect that is most likely that I will motivate? What triggers a person to really start to look, to shop, to get information, to go online and see what kind of dog I might, might want? What are some of those triggers? Know what business you're in. And to the person who wants to come and adopt, you're not in the business of, you know, dogs. You're in the business of meeting their needs. That's what they're thinking about.